does alcohol affect recovery as far as you know as far as i know like great. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for recovery <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, next question is from renata what's the hardest part of your job Working with her. I was gonna say the same. <laughs> the first thing that Renata told me and the guys when I was coming, they were like, man, those guys are super nice, they're super cool people, right? She said that. She Renata said that. said that. She said that. Nah, no, yeah. Renata. What's up, people? Welcome back to Change Over Podcast. Uh, today, we are here in Pompano Beach. I'm Justin Roberts. To my right, I got Jordan McGinley and Big Zoo, Evan Zoo over there. Before we get started, just remember we have a deal with ProStringer, so if you or a friend is a ProStringer, please go to the website and check out with our promo code, CHANGEOVER, get $100 off. We are trying to get to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube by the end of March, so please, if you like the content on the, on the page, hit the subscribe button, keep commenting, keep liking, keep sharing the videos, we appreciate the support. And today we have a different episode today, we got a coach in the building. Uh, you've probably seen this man on, on Instagram with some pretty pretty highly viewed uh, fitness reels, high quality. <laughs> I wonder if you have like a personal videographer at the, at the sessions. Um, he works with a lot of highly ranked players, Tommy Paul, Kovacevic, Ethan Quinn, uh, Renato Zarazua, Zarazua, to name a few. Um, some days I've even, even used some of your reels if I needed some inspiration on what to do. If I didn't know what to do, I actually use some of your reels. Uh, probably one of the best in the in the business that what he does, especially in this area. Uh, fitness coach at Everton's Academy, Franco Herrero. Thanks for joining Hello, us, guys. man. How you doing? Thanks. Hope everything's good. We were uh, we were lucky enough to get in contact with you, I guess, through Renata and some of the other pros that we um, that we were lucky enough to have on the podcast. So, um, how's it been working with so many high level pros, and what's your experience been like as they got to the levels that they've been got getting to recently? I mean, it's been a, definitely a lot of fun. I mean, we st I started working first uh, at the Ever Tennis Academy. I was director there from 2014 to 2018 mm -hmm. when I came from Argentina. I'm from Argentina originally. So after that, I started working. I was working part-time with Monica Puig. Um, and then 2018, I decided to leave the academy and go work with, with Monica full-time. And then since then, basically, 2019, uh, I started working independently with different pros mm -hmm. in the area. Kind of like started building up and um, pros and juniors actually i enjoy also working a lot with juniors but it's been fantastic i mean tennis is a sport that i played since i was really young i started playing tennis when i was five years old and um, i got both of my parents that are like uh, strength and conditioning coaches in argentina so it's kind of cool because i put both things together that are my passions and uh, and here i am you know i enjoy like uh, being part of of this sport from from inside at the high level and um I really, really enjoy my, my work, like being day after day with the guys, and it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. Have you worked with any other sports outside of tennis, um, at least growing up in, before Everton, that sort of stuff, or right now? Yes. I mean, my, as I said, my, my dad has a gym. So my mom's gym is a gym that is only for women in Argentina. Okay. So it's more like aesthetic and stuff like that. But I used to do, that was kind of like where I had my first job. I used to be a cycling instructor okay I mean, that, that's how i pay my big my, energy yeah. <laughs> that, that's how i was paying, you know when i was in college uh -huh. uh, when i was going out and stuff uh, so it was good and then at my dad's gym we had a lot of different athletes my dad is quite recognized in argentina for working with athletes from different sports and uh, and there i had the, the opportunity to in the gym though on the weight room to work with different sports. I never was able to work with any other sport in on field outside but uh, yes in the gym so I definitely I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot from it, uh, trying to analyze and, and determine what are the most important capacities that you have to work on every sport. And, uh, and it's fun. I mean, it's a different challenge. But since then, since I moved into the States, it's all been about the uh, tennis pretty tennis. much. And now I'm getting into pickle, like okay. for tennis players is the dark side. <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> but, uh, but to be fair and to be honest, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, it's a new challenge. and. Uh, at the end of the day, I like working with anybody that wants to get better, you know, and, and, and work hard. Like that, that's and pickleball is for recreational players or are you working with like high-level pickleball players? Professional, actually. Oh, really? Professional. I, actually, to answer one of the questions I did at the beginning of the podcast, uh, my wife uh, works as, uh, she has a social media agency. 
I was just joking. So, That's yeah. actually a video. <laughs> <laughs> so I did have a, a private person, okay. you know, social media okay. manager. Uh, Shout out to Wednesday. So that's yeah. why my company is such a high quality. It's not okay. me. It's not me. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, so she's a lot into pickleball. Like she started, mm -hmm. she used to work uh, for Maratoglu actually as a okay. uh, social media manager. And then after that, she moved into, like when she moved into the state, she started working on pickleball and kind of like got into a niche. And, and she works with a lot of the pickleball professional players. With the, She was managing managing the the MLP league that is one okay. of the big leagues you know in pickleball like the whole like social media for it and uh, so her agency is growing great and she takes care of my content and that's how basically I got into you know the, the pickleball world I started working mm. with some professional players and it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun I got like at the moment we got five different pickleball players okay and them. how similar is pickleball movement to mm. tennis movement and then also how similar are other sports movement to tennis movement is it a completely different thing or are there a few fundamentals that are very similar i think it is a different thing at the end of the day you know the core coverage is so much more in tennis uh, definitely like it, it depends if you're talking about like doubles or singles in pickleball i think that doubles you know is of course way more more passive but there is the certain capacities that you gotta really pay attention to and try to work on on singles, you, you do have some more movement. I mean, this kind of like short and explosive movements, the points tend to be pretty short, even shorter than tennis, and the distance is even shorter, you know? Okay. So you try to, to adapt the workout and to work on things that, that are like specific for pickleball. Then mm -hmm. there is, of course, certain things in terms of the strength, like, you know, the, the work on the core, you know, certain things that are like injury prevention related and stuff like that, that they correlate a lot. But then I try to, of course, uh, you know, try to detect what are the, the most important things on every sport and, okay. and uh, be specific in that area. So it wouldn't be as much of a conditioning sport as tennis would be, pickleball? No, I mean, like the actions are, are pretty short, I mean, and, yeah. and, and explosive. Like there's not much. I mean, tennis is also like a pretty, like, uh, you know, like the points, they go like the average, they go into four to six six balls, but the core coverage is, is probably more, you know, and you do have like certain rallies or moments and stuff that uh, where the points they get extended and, mm. and you have to work also on those capacities to be able not only to sustain you know your energy through the point but also to recover for the next one and and then for the next day for the next game and everything because yeah. you know? i've seen at some of your workouts that you guys run some 400 meters on the on the track yeah it's probably i talked about <laughs> in the last episode like we had some punishments with 400 meters it's probably the worst the worst punishment in my opinion like because it's like it's short it's enough punishment it's the worst, <laughs> it's the most difficult exercise because I feel like it's short enough that you can run hard, but it's long enough that it's going to hurt. Like it's not, it's no way to get through it without it being painful, I feel like, for the lungs and the legs. Yeah. And so you guys do that. But I was thinking like tennis is a very demanding sport in terms of we get a lot of pounding on the body, mm -hmm. especially if you play on hard courts. Yeah. Um, and I remember, I don't have really a quote, but I remember Murray saying after his hip surgery, he couldn't train that way anymore because of the pounding on the body do you think about that in terms of not trying to overload the body the player's body in terms of like i guess tough training outside of the court is that something that you worry about or that you try to balance 100 percent, 120 percent. i mean it's a uh, i think that uh, as, as you mentioned really well i mean tennis is a sport that has a, a lot of impact a lot of acceleration a lot of decelerations a lot of change of direction and all that, you know, creates stress into the body. And it's a stress that goes into the body like day after day since, you, you guys know, I mean, since you're like probably five, six, seven years old yeah. until you're like 20 and you've been like doing it for that amount of years for two, three hours a day. So that's a lot of stress for the body. So when I plan my workouts, definitely there is a, there has to be a balance between like impact and non-impact activities. And that balance also gets like change with uh, according to the conditions. Like I'm gonna put like a very easy example that Renata was here in the podcast. Rena, when she was 15 years old, she had her first knee surgery. At 18, she had her second knee surgery. Mm -hmm. She loves running. Like Rena is the type of person that I have to tell her like slow to stop. Down. Like yeah. you, you gotta tell her like to slow down to stop. Yeah. She's uh, she's that type of person. And uh, since we started working together, a lot has been like telling her basically like. No, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, you get an, like, even though I love running and I love to, you know, to make my players run, there is certain specific situations where we need to adjust and we need to definitely like take care of that. There is many other like uh, strategies that you can use that they reduce the impact 
and the body and uh, like the Versa climber, the bike, the soul bike, mm -hmm. anything you want to use um, that you can create the same stimulus in terms of the cardiovascular like uh, demand. And uh, at the same time, you're not putting extra pounding in the body. Mm -hmm. So um, if you ask me personally, I'm a big lover of running for tennis players but of course i understand that there is certain scenarios or situations where i need to adapt i can't do the same with everyone you know everyone has different bodies um you got like you can have like a like a big guy like ethan working also with a girl like renata mm -hmm. you know and and they have different totally different demands also i feel like the the game style from each one of your players you know is different so you gotta know how much you know like your player really needs i feel like i always think that uh, i like to put on my players the least stress possible mm -hmm. but i need to obtain you know the level of fitness that i need them to have for them to be able to perform at their best that is the balance that i try to play with like try to put the least stress possible but try to optimize their fitness and uh, and it's a tough it's a tough line you know and uh, many times you know it's it's hard to find, but that's what I've been trying to do for years. Like, have you learned some hard lessons in that? Have you ever pushed the player too hard? Uh, I th yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will be lying if I say no. I yeah. mean, like, I think that I, of course I made my mistakes, and I I'm very very how you say out of critic. Like, I kind of like criticize myself. Okay, like, self critical. Yeah. Yeah, self critical. Sorry, and uh, and I try to go back. Like every time that okay, I see that something happens or something, I try to go back on myself mm. and see like okay, what do I do? Where where do I mess up? You know, mm. do I do something wrong? Sometimes he's being like, no, look, like, I think it just had to happen. Or sometimes you are like, damn, I, I could have done this better. And mm -hmm. I really try to, to learn the lesson. And a lot, uh, a lot, you know, of what I do nowadays is being like, uh, I'm sorry for my old players. No, okay. like from, <laughs> yeah. from the learning curve of, of being, you know, on tour more and more and more. For and sure. uh, I'm constantly learning. I'm, I'm actually, I try to be constantly learning from those things because let's put a like a scenario that was very recent like Tommy definitely like going like winning a tournament and going into the final of the next one and uh, we've never been on the situation where he goes that deep you know for weeks in a row and of course mm -hmm. he's the perfect scenario but then from a fitness standpoint like the guy hasn't hit a workout you know in two weeks and okay what are you gonna do how are you gonna manage the volumes now because you got the next tournament coming up uh, and you want to prepare for it but at the same time you need to give the body a rest so you're constantly trying to learn, you know, and the experience makes you learn of that. And the 400s, for example, saying that we do more towards pre-season. I don't yeah. do much of 400s during the year, but yeah. we do use them on the pre-seasons. Um, and when we do conditioning, like something that I like to do is if we are doing conditioning three times a week, definitely one of them is non impact. Okay. okay. As a basic thing, like two might be with impact. Uh, one is going to be non impact. And in many cases, it, it gets to be like, two non-impact with one impact if there is something you know that is buying and if it is necessary and I have to do the three of them without impact then I'm, I do it mm -hmm. you know like uh, it's not like I can't be so like straight on oh, no, we gotta yeah. run you fix you know oh you gotta run gotta run no man yeah. like you need to adapt because if not you're gonna break the player at the end of the day you want the play on court that's when they get better so yeah. hey guys quick break Justin here from The Changeover. I'm gonna talk about Pro Stringer. It's a great machine that I use, Jody uses, and a lot of other pros use as well. You can use it at home, on the road, really anywhere there's a tabletop surface. It takes me about 25, 30 minutes to string a racket on this machine. It is easy to travel with, fits in carry-on, suitcase, tennis bag, no issues at TSA. It's a big money saver. And you can save even more when you use our code, Changeover, to get $100 off the machine back to the episode uh i know you said you worked with a lot of juniors as well would your workouts vary between a junior and a pro if like the say the junior is still growing or their body's still developing would there be any changes that you would specifically make in the workout compared to like a pro player who's already yeah i mean 100 percent, 100 percent. i think that when you're on the on the juniors it's, it's the same as in tennis you're developing you know and you're like really developing there's it's a process of learning learning the right movement patterns is more about like teaching, you know, and I feel like, and that's why I enjoy that too, because it's more about like teaching with a pro, you tell him what to do pretty much. And the pro knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. He's been doing it for 20 years already. So if there was like some good work on the past, you're pretty much just giving instructions. Yeah. Some small corrections and tweaks here and there, 
but that's all what it is. You know, when you're t working with juniors, you're, you become a professor. I'm, I'm actually a professor in physical education. So that's okay. when I feel like I'm, I'm actually like teaching and um, to teach them the right movement patterns so they can, you know, like at the end of the day, have a long career, like yeah. uh, to build up, you know, the volumes, because of course they never like with a, with a pro, for example, I mean, they go with a pro to the track on preseason and he might do like 10, 400s, yeah. but on the same video that you saw the 400s, you saw a little kid running on yeah. the back <laughs> and that little kid, I mean, he went out there and he crashed five and uh, for him, you know, that that's what it was necessary. And then like to build up and to adapt that volume to the specific age of the player, I think that's very important. And at the end of the day, I take it way more as uh, as learn as teaching and developing than than training. Yeah, like with a pro, I feel like I'm training. I'm training them. With a junior, I'm of course training their capacities, but I'm focusing more on the on the teaching, so they have the right techniques and the right movement patterns and and stuff for them to have a, a good career. And then. Once they once they learn the movement patterns properly, I feel like it's all about like increasing load basically. Mm -hmm. You know, like if okay, if they know how to do a row, then it's just about like moving high, bigger dumbbells, you mm -hmm. know, or, or <laughs> cables or whatever it is. But if they don't know how to do it, then you're in trouble because you know, like it's a complete different thing. So to, yeah. for me to teach them how to do it properly is the most important because then that's gonna translate to everything, and then I'm just focusing on increasing loads, and that's how I start training them. Yeah. Like, you you briefly touched on Tommy's um, run, like between that's Dallas and Del Rey is the run you're talking about, right? Yeah. So we talk, you talked briefly about how challenging it was for you to maintain his fitness throughout that run. So we'll get to that eventually. But in terms of education, um, how important is that for you? Like in terms of your education, because I imagine working with players' bodies where their body is their career. You know that that must be a lot of pressure for you because you're the one responsible for their bodies in a way yeah. um obviously you can't control everything but how important is education for you and understanding the the, the science, I guess the science the exactly the science of the body i mean i think it's key i mean the, to have the basic education like i i, I went to i mean i studied as i said i'm a professor in phys professor in physical education in argentina but physical education is very oriented to to school in Argentina. I think it's the same here in the States. Uh, we don't have exercise science. So okay. we have physical education as a professor is very oriented to high school, school and stuff like that. So then I had to do most of my certifications like outside of that. At the same time that I was studying in college, sorry. No um, I was taking other degrees, kind of like one year courses and stuff like that, classes to, to learn more about like specific training and uh, and I think that doing that, plus also like the day after day, like reading and trying to learn new things and, you know, trying to stay like uh, permanently, like getting better. I think it's, it's extremely important. I try to, sometimes I feel like with a routine nowadays, you know, with so much work and stuff like that, it's tough for me to keep yeah. up, you know, with the new things and stuff. But I definitely try to, to stay uh, all the time as, as updated as possible. Exactly. Also, I love, um, I love learning from my colleagues. I, I have I have very good colleagues that actually they're they're big friends of mine too, and I really enjoy like having conversations like with a beer in between. But yeah. you know, trying to <laughs> yeah, but trying to you know get as much information as possible through them and stuff. Like I'm I'm very lucky to have like the friends that I have that they're in my opinion way better than me. Like okay. they're, they're really 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 experienced fitness coaches, and. Um, that was great for me. Like when I came into a state, I was super young and I had these groups of this group of really good uh, fitness coaches like Gabriel Echeverria that was working for USDA. Now he's with Ben Shelton, uh, Alejandro Lacour. Right now he's with uh, Evans, uh, Claudio Galasso, another guy he used to be with Monica Puig and he was in Albania for many, many years. So I was getting information from them like constantly, you know, and, uh, and trying to get as much as I could, you know, in those conversations and, and learn from them. And uh, nowadays, I still do. I went to the beach the other day with Claudio and I were talking and he's a very knowledgeable person and I try to to keep constantly learning. And then, of course, um, besides, you know, the, the reading, the learning through that and stuff, then the, what we were talking before, you know, the experience. Experiences. Sometimes you, you just learn from the experience. I feel like logic, like trying to be logic is very important. Uh, I don't try to do anything crazy. Like if someone comes to my fitness sessions and expect to get like the magic pill, I... It's just not gonna happen. I don't do anything crazy, nothing weird. 
there's no like Franco <laughs> method. There's no, 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 no. <laughs> this is simple. You know, I, I, I try to be as simple as possible and I, I'm a true believer. And this is something that comes probably from my dad because he always would repeat it that the, the basics well done, they, they work, you know, and uh, sometimes people try to skip those steps and go into like crazy things and do like, maybe if you keep it more basic and you keep it simple and you do it properly, you obtain a way bigger benefit than if you try to go out there and do the craziest exercise ever. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it Kobe who said he does the basics very well? You seen that? That's where a lot of people say that who, who are like oh, some okay. of the best yeah, in the world yeah. stuff, but probably. I think uh, fitness is one of these things where like, I have a lot of respect for the fitness trainers that are constantly learning, you know, like I respect the ones who like, you can see that they're doing research and it's not necessarily an experiment, but like they're learning new ways and as time develops, they develop. Cause then I feel like it's one of these things where it can just pass you by, you know, like in the past people would like their old methods, I guess in the past that you, that are outdated now in fitness as you learn. I think, if, like you said, if you get so locked up in the grind of doing this over and over and over again, you forget to also learn, then you can be one of the people that it passes you by, you yeah. know? No, no, no. I, I Believe me, I, I think about it. I think about it and, uh, and uh, sometimes I feel like, dude, like I need to stop. You go like, man, I need to stop and I need to, you know, like get back into that learning process. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, on my, on my daily life, I try to learn as much as I can. But uh, I do definitely like sometimes get stuck in that. And, and I'm like, dude, like you, you got to get back into, you know, like the, the, like getting to study. Yeah. Uh, 100%. And it happens a lot. I agree. And I say that I think about it like quite a bit. We were talking about it the other day with, with these guys, fitness coaches, friends of mine. They go like, man, like, there's a moment where you feel that like you're so into the routine that you forget about that part that is super important. So definitely like, something to, to pay attention to. I want to talk to you about weightlifting. So I feel like people have different, I guess, ideas about it. And if it's applicable to tennis or not. I remember when I was young, I would have people telling me that you don't want to lift weights, you don't want to get too too heavy, too too jacked. And then, so when I went to college, we would lift in a lot of weights and we got a lot stronger. What is, how do you use weightlifting to, I guess, improve the, I guess, the speed and power of your athletes? And how do you try to make it as safe as possible or in a way that's as applicable to tennis as possible? It's, it's a really good question. Uh, and it's a very interesting topic to talk about because a lot of people, you know, like wants to know about it. I think that first of all, like starting from, from the question that he was asking me before, I mm -hmm. think that it's very important when kids are in the developmental stage to bring them into the weight room and teach them the right movement patterns. Because what happens a lot is that you find yourself with kids that are like 17 years old, 18 years old, and they should be moving units mm -hmm. that they have no clue what they're doing, you know, when they're on the weight room. So. Yeah. Going back to his question, I think that it's very important from early stages to get players into the weight room, but with the goal of teaching them how to do the right movement, how to push, how to pull, how to squat, how to hinge, how to lunge on the right ways. So if you got those patterns properly, by the age that where a kid is like 15, 16 years old, it's just, as I said before, it's just increasing, you know, weights. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely safe. There is absolutely no nothing that could happen you know if you're doing it the right way good technique um, yeah. but you gotta have the right technique it's like everything if you're hitting your forehand you know with the grip like this and you're going whatever <laughs> yeah at some point man you're hitting it two hours a day people tends to get way more worried sometimes for a kid going into a weight room you know and doing some exercises than someone that is probably hitting yeah, 20 way. million forehands <laughs> like, you know way, with, yeah. the, with the worst ever technique <laughs> dude like he, yeah. he's gonna get hurt through that yeah. not, not on the way yeah, he's gonna do like 10 through. reps you know yeah. Something. Yeah. like he's doing 20 million reps a week from the other thing yeah. so yeah <laughs> uh, so that you know it's i think it's weightlifting and weight training is extremely important for any athlete because any action that you do on a on a court or in any action on life uh you're doing it through your strength, you know, through mm -hmm. your muscles. So um, the force that you're able to apply into the ground to change direction, to accelerate, to decelerate and stuff like that is going to depend on how strong you are. Then once you have the strength levels, yes, then you have to be how efficient and how good you are at applying that force into the ground or into any movement that you're trying mm -hmm. to do. So if you ask me, okay, but what is the right level of strength, you know, that a that player should have or someone, the one that is useful for his sport? It's as simple as that. Like, is it the same from a rugby player than from a tennis player? Definitely not. You know, like it's a complete, or from a football player to a tennis player? No, 
like a tennis player doesn't need those levels of strength. You know, they need probably to be able to sustain and do it over and over and over uh, to apply that force fast over and over and over. It's a totally different demand, but that weight training has to be part of developing a tennis player. I'm 100% convinced of it. And uh, I mean, it's not me. I mean, everyone that is serious in, in the, you know, strength and condition mm -hmm. would say like, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely necessary. Um, you don't need to overdo it. You don't need to stop doing it. It's, it's what I was saying before. I'm, I'm pretty simple. Everything is, there's no one thing, yes, and this thing, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. You got to cover all the areas of the training. You got to cover the speed. You got to cover the agility. You got to cover acceleration, deceleration, footwork, uh, coordination, balance, strength, conditioning. So everything has to be in the package to build a well-rounded tennis player. Mm -hmm. You can do one thing, yes, and the other one, no. Yes. So when... On, on this topic, so now we're talking about maintaining, I guess, the level that you need. So back to the Tommy thing. Mm -hmm. So he went two weeks in a row where he won, was it five matches in Dallas? Like and then four. Four, in four Dallas, so you got a buy and then four. Yeah. And then the same thing in Delray. And he played a buy four, and yeah. then four. So what was it like for you to be able to try and get him to maintain? Like, what was his fitness like during that those weeks? Because those, I feel like that's something that I didn't necessarily do that well in my career like maintain the fitness while playing matches because i guess the mentality that i had was that i just played a tough match today i have to play another one tomorrow or day after tomorrow so you don't want to go too hard and then in the small break you have in between like let's say i lose today and i have five days before my next match now is when i can do some stuff so how is it different for these guys who are at the top who play so many matches and what have you done to to try to accommodate that that's uh that's another really good question. That's that's uh, that's uh, the, the, probably the most challenging thing about tennis. You know, tennis is uh, an all year like round sport, and you're competing basically the whole year. Yes, we do have preseason. We have probably the shortest preseason ever. Like to be honest, the preseason nowadays is four or five weeks. If you see it from a physiological standpoint, and being completely honest, how how much can you improve certain parameters? Pretty little, you know. So I think that. The way you work in tennis is through year calendars. My goal is to kind of like improve like on a year calendar constantly, you know, as much as I can. I don't think that, you know, with the amount of time that we have in training blocks and preseason and stuff like that, we can develop a player like a lot. You know, we, we have to think about it like a long process. Like I'm thinking on a player like Ethan. Right now I'm working with Ethan, you know, and he's super young. Um, I'm thinking in Ethan like, one year from now, two years from now, three years from now, you know, how his body is going to develop towards the player that he wants to be. Um, in the case of a guy like Tommy, what, for your question, uh, basically, like, when a player starts winning too much, what we try to do is, like, the mornings, for example, like, before, winning too like, much. <laughs> <laughs> like, winning, like, winning, sorry, many matches. No, bad. that's the, uh, that's the language barrier. You don't mean winning too much, you mean winning so much. Winning obviously. so much, my bad. It's always good, you know. Yeah. But, but uh, when a player starts winning, you know, like, on a more, like, constant base, uh, like, we definitely try to do some maintenance work, like, before the matches. We try to work on those areas where we don't create any fatigue, but we try to maintain certain parameters. Let me put it like mobility. I think that it's a great, like tournament is a great uh, moment to develop, yeah, like, to work on the mobility. Like, people just ask it, you know, as a warm up, like whatever. And I think that if there's a good moment to increase your mobility levels, it's in tournaments. Like, it's not going to create any fatigue. You got like, like, you got the time to do it. You can include it during your warm-ups, like before, and then like, you know do your stretchings after your, your matches and stuff like that. So it's a great moment to to work on that. Then there is certain things that you can do in terms of like power maintenance, like doing some jumps, throws, uh, and then including some mild strengthening exercises that they're more like prehab exercises and core exercises that they will not create any fatigue, but that they will allow for a player to you know like not lose everything you've been working on through the preseason or the training blocks while they're on the tournament. And then, as you mentioned, you know, right when you have like the opportunity because you lost early, of course, you never want to lose early, but if you lose like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it is, like trying to get back to work right away in terms of your fitness, we try to be super disciplined with that. Um, I was saying like before, when I came to the podcast, you know that Tommy lost yesterday in Acapulco, first round, I mean, not a great match. He called me right away. He goes, I do. We got to get to work. Like, we got Indian Wells coming up. 
I'm getting on a plane tomorrow, I'm going to Inner Wells, we're going to be training for one full week, you know, to prepare for, for that. And I'm not seeing that as a preparation only for Indian Wells. What I'm thinking is like, okay, he played, he played Dallas, he played Delray, he went deep on those. He had to take two days off because he can, he was coming from a lot of matches. And then he flew into Acapulco, he played Acapulco and now, okay, we got this training week. And I'm not only thinking about the next two tournaments coming up, I'm thinking of an accumulation of work, what I was saying before, like, it's, a, it's every time we have the opportunity to put some work through the year, we try to do it. Of course, giving the body a break, you know, when it's needed. But, and that's where you got to be very good in balance. But whenever we have the opportunity to go at it, we, just, we jump back at it because we know that the year is long and we want to stay healthy through the whole season. If not, that's when you start seeing the, the player crumbling down towards the end of the season and injuries happen, no? And how soon does that happen? Like if one of your players goes out early, would that be like the same day or would that be the next day or do you typically try to give a day off after the match or does that depend on how the week went? I think it, it depends a lot in, in couple factors. It, it depends on how long the match was. Like if the match was a tough match, I definitely try to give them like a, like a day off the next day and then jump into it the following okay. day. If the match was sort of like easy, they lost like quite easy, I think we can, yeah, we, yeah. we can get back to work. You can, like you can do some work, buddy, it's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. The match lasts 46 seconds, you can do some 400s today. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting no, the hair. Yeah. Def definitely yeah. not the same day, like we, we never, okay. you know, go back at it the same day because of course there's emotional components, you know, that are important and that was going to be my next parameter, you know, like sometimes mentally for different reasons, you know, a player needs to take probably a little longer break, like take, okay, take two days off, you know, like go to your house, enjoy, do something different, and then we go back at it. Or they got to go, like, whatever, visit their girlfriend. Hey, man, go visit your girlfriend, come back. And um, you know that you have to understand, too, and that's another tough part, understanding also that it's not about what you want in terms of their fitness, but also that you're working with person, you know, no robots. Sometimes I feel like we tend to think, yeah, oh, no, they're, they're robots, you know, like, oh, they got to get back to work. You gotta, yeah, man, but at the end of the day, like, there's something here, too, that is going on, and you need to give that mind a break or let them do whatever they need to do for them to be healthy here. So when they come back into the weight room, they're ready to do it. Yeah. You know, you don't want to have a player that is not ready, like mentally to, to put the work on. So I've seen, for example, like I like to watch basketball, but I've seen these guys, like they will play a game. Let's say the Miami Heat is in Milwaukee. They will play a night game. And then after the game, they will lift. Sometimes I've seen that. Is that something that you would ever do, like same day as matches, like a light lift or anything like that? And does it matter what time you lift? Because I feel like I've, I've seen, heard on podcasts and stuff like working out after a certain hour is not good because, I don't know, you need to recover, you need to sleep and these things. So how important is the timing of workouts as well? I think that in, in basketball, for example, I was in a, I remember being in the Equinox in Miami when I was uh, working with the, one of my players with Edmond, with Kyle Edmond, and uh, the, the guys from Milwaukee Bucks, the, mm -hmm. what is the name of the tall guy? The Giannis? Guy. Yeah, Giannis. I, yeah. He, they were playing that night and the guy was crashing a workout. He was for one hour crashing a workout in the morning. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot has to do with the fact that basketball, uh, it's completely different. That's why you need to know, you know, which sport you're working on. Yeah. I think basketball is a completely different demand. and. Uh, and the players, I mean, when they are in season compared to when they are in, in post season, when they are in playoffs and stuff like that, that you're gonna see probably more, like when they are during the season. But probably you're gonna start, see, you're gonna stop seeing it so much in, in, in the playoffs. playoffs you know? yeah. uh, so it really depends, and you really need to adapt in that sense. I would never do it probably after a match. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible. There's nothing wrong with doing it, but mm -hmm. I would probably not do it after a match. I have done like before matches sometimes some sort of activation that includes, as I said before, you know, probably some some jumping, some throwing, especially working on their power, you know, to maintain their power or or maybe like a mild strength exercise to maintain certain levels of strength, but nothing that can create fatigue because at the end of the day, you know, tennis is a one against one sport and you want the player to be at the end of the day, like they are tennis players, they're not fitness players, and they need to perform when they're, they're on the court. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know it's the honest truth. Like, at mm. the end of the day, you know the player needs to feel good on the court, so I want him to be prepared. Um, as I say in the mornings, I, I do cert some sort of activation mm. with some mild strengthening exercises or like some power exercise, but I wouldn't probably like hit a, a tough lift you know, with a tennis player, when they're like basketball players, they do it. Mm -hmm. like, definitely they do. I've seen it. 
I'm curious about so Grand Slams. They play three out of five. Yep. And sometimes you will see a player who's, let's say, going deep in slams like a Tommy, but you might see them looking kind of gassed in a three set match. Can you can you explain how that happens? Yeah, I mean, I think it. There's many things that it's an answer that could be pretty long because there are sometimes sometimes things are emotional mm -hmm. like you know there's a lot of emotional stress sometimes in certain yeah. matches so that's the worst uh, <laughs> so sometimes, worst sometimes you cramp from just being nervous bro, the worst <laughs> is three out of the uh, first and you're dying and you just know it's not even physical today you just yeah. oh my god that's the worst when you know the, the the mind is can be you know very tough in that sense mm -hmm. so i think that when there's a lot of emotional stress those are the matches or of course conditions you know sometimes the players is not adapted to certain conditions like humidity mm. uh, you know the the weather like you get the players that are from eastern europe and stuff like that that when they go to play pro into very tough conditions if they're not using training uh, there even though they're great athletes they might suffer more than others but i think that a lot has to do with the emotional component many times um i remember tommy like uh, Tommy being like in US Open like three years ago, uh, sorry, two years ago, he played, he won his first match in US Open. He could never win a match like until then. And he beat the uh, Zapata Mirayas on a five setter, like the, the amount of stress, I mean, it was extremely high. He really wanted to win in US Open, you know, he's American, mm -hmm. he loves playing here. And that match was extremely demanding. And then right after that, like two days after he played with Corda, another five setter. And two days after he played with, with uh, Ruth, like uh, you know, like five sets, and uh, and he ends up losing pretty bad on the fifth, and I think that, you know, the, the accumulation of that emotional stress plus the physical stress, of course, that you put on the body is, is really tough, and definitely like we try to do certain adaptations uh, when we're going into a swing where there is a three out of five like tournament like like a Grand Slam, mm -hmm. uh, compared to when we go into like probably a swing where we don't have that. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, just to set an example, like like checking, you know, like Tommy's body weight when when he goes into three out of five, we know that he tends to to lose some body weight, you know, through the tournament because of the competition and stuff. Of course, we don't want it to happen, but it happens. You know, we want to pay attention to the nutrition supplements and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, sometimes, you know, with the, with the competition and we've seen it with Rafa, I think matches he, he he said that he lost I don't know how many kilograms, you know, yeah. where they go and they. The demand, the sport of the sport, like, it takes you to lose a lot of body weight, and that match to match, you know, starts like creating some struggle. Mm -hmm. So we want to go into the Grand Slams with a little extra, probably weight, weight. on him, okay. uh, in case you know that happens. Uh, he he doesn't feel weak, you know, through the tournament and stuff like that. So, so how would you manage that beforehand, mm -hmm. like if you know they're about to go into a slam where they can play a lot of hours, especially when you have players that the Tommy's now what top top 20 in the world, something like that. Yeah. So top 15 even. Top now, 15, yeah. yeah. So you, not that there's like expectation, but like there's a good chance that he can have a long two weeks. So how does the build up to that go? Like how, how do you implement like the diet and that sort of stuff beforehand? We try, I mean, du during preseason, for example, when we prepare now for, for Australia, we try to, you know, keep track of it. Like just be tracking it, like see, okay, where he's at. Like we know that we have a goal. Uh, we last year we got lucky. I mean, Tommy got into the semifinals. You know, he was able to have a pretty good run, and uh, it's the first time. Actually, funny enough, uh, like the U.S. Open is when it happened that that uh, he went into those three matches of five sets. And to be honest, when when the third one finished, and we go back to what we were talking before, like the learning. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I looked at him and I'm like, oh man, he looks thin. Like you know, he looks like he took his shirt off right after the match. I'm like, damn, like. I think we, we, we got to do something about this. And um, so basically, like when we go to the next preseason and we're like, then the end of the year is all, you know, like two out of three because you play indoors and stuff like that with the body weight that he feels good. He like, which is a certain number, you know, like we know that he's fine. Like we are not going to struggle there. But when we're preparing for Australian Open, that's when I was like, man, I think we need to bulk up a little. We need to come into Australia with a little extra weight because I saw what happened to us, you know, in the US Open. I don't want that to happen again. And Australia and, um, is probably demanding conditions as well, right? Correct. 
Very demanding. Yeah. And then, like, when he got to that Australian Open is when he had the semifinal run, you know, where he did actually really good. I'm not saying it's because of so that it's or body anything. Weight. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, like, no, it wasn't me. Guy plays general tennis when he wants because of the body weight. Yeah? Like, Fitness player. <laughs> you do hear some of those out there. <laughs> but, but we were like, you know, okay, we, we think that that is a good you know a good a good adaptation that's something good that we added you know to yeah. the to the package and th that's it no i don't think that <laughs> gotcha yeah, right. i'm not saying it wasn't me you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, i would never say that no, no. but so, uh, it's, you can uh, thank it though it's okay, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah man like so for what about recovery so what do you believe in for recovery like uh what would their recovery routines look like ice bath or like mobility or massages, what do you believe in? Well, we, we're lucky. I mean, we work with a, with a really good physio, Seba. Seba joined the team like two years ago, and to me, it was like, it's been like a game changer. Since uh, Tommy had Seba into the team, I mean, everything has been fantastic. For me, I mean, I feel like I break, he fixes. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's actually incredible. Like he, when, when Tommy started working with Seba, he had like a pretty chronic elbow condition. You know, he had some stuff going on in his body that he couldn't solve for, for a long, long time. And then uh, he's been really, really good for us because he, every time, you know, like something happens and stuff like that, he jumps right into it. He works on a daily basis with Tommy in terms of recovery. I think that he's probably the most important person that we have in the team because he, he takes care of Tommy's body like before, like when we started the day, you know, he would mobilize his body and stuff like that, try to work on some, if he needs to release certain tissues and stuff like that, he would do it. And then at the end of the day, on getting the treatment, even, you know, when it is super late, those guys, they, m many times, I mean, grand slams and stuff that you finish super late, they, they go straight into, you know, the table and get their treatment done. Uh, of course, uh, you know, if we got ice bath available, we try to definitely go for it. I think that ice <laughs> is something that we use whenever we have the opportunity and we have it available. Uh, treatment to me is extremely important. And then everything that has to do in terms of nutrition and supplementation, I think it's super important. And sleep, you know, sometimes we forget about the, the basic things. Mm -hmm. I think that through, mm -hmm. through the nutrition, the supplements and the sleep, you can obtain a lot of benefit in terms of of recovery and it's something that everyone can do it then you know like having a physio available for you it's something that not everyone has the opportunity to have um but then ice also is something that you can definitely do even if you're on your own yeah. you got the opportunity to do compression boots it's welcome too. like we, we do use them too so all the tools that we have you know we try to optimize anything that we can control we try to you know like mm -hmm. uh, use it and, and try to improve Tommy's you know recovery you mentioned having having some beers earlier like how how does alcohol affect recovery as far as you know as far as I know like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for recovery <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. great uh, for a good time for yeah. sure <laughs> no I mean definitely like you know there's a lot of investigation in terms of alcohol like you know and how it can affect they probably Having one beer is not going to affect that much, mm -hmm. but uh, but definitely, I mean, if you have to compete the next day, you know, and you got to like perform, like, <laughs> no, nah, I'm a big beer drinker, yeah, too, don't worry, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's definitely not ideal, not only for, for in terms of the recovery for the body, but also in terms of the sleep, uh, alcohol affects a lot of the sleep, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of investigation research going on right now about that, and how it affects the different cycles of the sleep and stuff, and, and, as I was mentioning before, you know, his question, like, I think that sleep is one of the most important pillars in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do something that affects it, then definitely you, you don't want to do it. So if you can avoid it when you're in competition, it's great. Uh, but well, I mean, like then out of competition, you know, you, you might enjoy some, some beer. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and with the sleep, is there... I know everybody's different, but is there like a target number of hours you try to get Tommy to get or a time to go to bed you try to, you guys talk about or is it just whatever works, works? We, we, no, we don't really talk about it, but we definitely want to, you know, like get a good night of sleep, try to go to bed like before like 11, 12, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere around there, try to get a, a good amount of hours. Uh, some per, some players like using like there is like different artifacts right now like the snooze that create some white noise you know and stuff like that okay. but you 
it helps with the sleep. Um, there's different tools I feel like they're being used nowadays, but no, there's not like a target. I think that whatever the body needs to to be to recover, recover, you want you want to have it. So, For sure. um, can you give three to five tips, like just a handful of tips, I guess, for those players without a fitness coach? Um, like just any pointers you can for for training training weeks and how to set up their weeks. Like for a tennis player trying to get in shape, like what are the main things that they can focus on? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, uh, I think that um, <clears throat> there are certain things that are standard. Like, if you work on, str- on your strength like once a week, you're not going to obtain much, you know, out of, of out of a benefit. Is it better than nothing? Yes, it is. But you want to be including like at least like two to three times a week of uh, like strength training. I think that definitely, like, we all know how important it is for a tennis player to work on some sort of like. Um, speed agility you know acceleration deceleration type of workout so i would definitely try to use one stimulus for that so we say like two like probably three strength sessions a week in which i will probably include you know also everything that has to do with injury prevention core and stuff like that work um and power and one time a week where i try to like probably work on on speed acceleration deceleration change of direction like general agility what I call like general agility, uh, you know, like sometimes people think everything has to be specific, but they can't really perform the, the basic movements properly, you know, like the running, like working on the running form, you know, you want to be a good tennis player, but you got to work on your running technique, you got to work on the way you accelerate, you got to work on the way you decelerate and stuff like that. So I think that having that general agility session is very important. One session oriented to work on the specifics for tennis coordination, balance, footwork, you know, like very specific movements and stuff like that. And then, of course, you want to have a stimulus or two for a conditioning, probably two, you know, and uh, with that, you know, you got like a, like a six times a week like training where you yeah. go like three times a week, you know, of strength, two times a week where you're working more movement based and one time a week where you're going into the condition, probably adding, you know, a little conditioning on, on one days, of the movement days, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, at the end of the, one of the movement days, you can add some condition and you got like three, two, two. It's a pretty good like balance, I think, in terms of stimulus. Um, also, so you touched a little bit on deceleration and funny enough, I was telling Justin, I want to say maybe like a month or two ago that I feel like I'm shit at deceleration. So <laughs> can you explain the importance of deceleration and how you go about training that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it is, I mean, there's a lot of players that are extremely fast, let's put it this way, but if you can't decelerate properly and well balanced, that power that force that you apply into the ground to accelerate let's say you're super good in, in accelerating like you're a fast player if you're not efficient and you're not good at at breaking and doing it with balance to be able to hit the ball and stuff like that there's two things that are going to happen number one you're not going to apply the level of force that you probably could apply when you're accelerating because you know you're bad at it yeah or number two you're going to find yourself out of balance positions when you get to the moment where you have to strike the ball you know and then like you know change direction to recover and stuff like that so in that regard, I think that we try to start working on the most basic ways, just, you know, like from different positions, like decelerate with different postures. Like it would be like with the feet together, like going into like a lunge, you know, like if you go into a forehand or into a backhand, you know, and you start doing it in more reduced spaces, trying to work on the form because the more, of course, the, the larger, you know, is the distance that you cover sprinting, then the yeah. tougher the, the, the deceleration that you're going to have to apply. So I think that starting with shorter distances and being able to do it properly and then increasing the distance on those changes, on those decelerations is uh, is probably one of the main cues. You know, you don't want to go into like, okay, I'm coming like full speed and now I got a break. I think that there are certain things that you, they need to happen also when you're decelerating, where you put your feet. Like when you accelerate, you know, you try to, attack the floor like kind of like under your body and, and push the ground that way to go this way. It's kind of like crazy. You know, you push the, yeah. the ground one way to go to the other side. Mm-hmm. But when you have to decelerate, your feet start going in front of your body, you know, like they come from being like pretty much under or behind your body to being in front of your body. So you can decide. So the position of your feet, making your steps smaller as you get to the change of direction zone and getting the center of gravity low, you know, it's super important. So those are cues that are extremely important uh, at that time, and uh, I don't know, I think that you just, it's, it's such an important part of the tennis player's life because it's, yeah, yeah. every time you, you go somewhere, you get to accelerate and you get to decelerate. Yeah. The amount not, of those matches. I great. feel like 
like over the last couple of years is not something that you hear about that much like deceleration you hear about change of direction but you don't think of the like the deceleration component you're thinking maybe like to just get to a position quick and get out of a position quick be not thinking of what it takes to get out of that position you know yeah and you posted uh-huh. a video of tommy you said would you see what you get it's like there's a point in dallas where he gets oh, pushed I, out I he slices one, he comes yeah. back he gets pushed back out again and he hits the running for a winner yeah. Yeah. P- pretty much the same as the drill they were doing and that's probably a part of why he, why he's so good on on the move i think tommy looks like when i watch him play like a great player from the back and it makes him, it's so hard to get through him because he moves so well and he's so solid in, in those wide positions. The deceleration, Pause. bro. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a... Fitness, fitness player. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's me, but... It's, it's <laughs> no, 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 no. The thing is, I think that, you know, like at the end of the day, also like shot quality in, as a professional tennis player, it's, uh, it's extremely important. It's not the most important thing, you know. And um, in order for you to be able to have a good shot quality, you need to be able to decelerate on a balanced position that allows you to hit the ball properly. Like, yeah, you might have a beautiful swing, you know, on the forehand, the backhand side, but if you have to take like four steps to the side and you find yourself completely out of position because you don't decelerate properly, then you're not going to be able to apply all the force that you could apply into a forehand, you know, or backhand or whatever it is and, and hit it and have the, the quality of the shot that you want to have, you know, to penetrate. So I think that that is, a, that, that's why it's so important, you know, to have a, to have a very good like shot quality. You need to have a good deceleration and a good balance mm-hmm. on that position. I yeah. think that's what it is about. And regarding Tommy, man, like, I always say like uh, I'm I'm extremely lucky like to to work with such a good athlete. Like I feel that I, I'm lucky because since the moment I met him, I mean Tommy, and this is something that is very important. Uh, with the question that he was asking me before about like juniors and stuff, Tommy, when he was a kid, he did like he played every single sport out there. And, uh, and for me, when, when the kids are young, that is one of the most important things that you can do because you get a lot of motor experiences, you know, different like experiences that you get to, to read situations, to change direction, to work on different patterns and stuff like that. Um, I always tell that, you know, when we started working, Tommy used to do like preseason and then at night he would go play like three against three basketball, like mm-hmm. for an hour and a half. And, uh, so I'm very lucky, you know, like since the moment I started working with Tommy, it's kind of like, it's, it's easy. It's pretty, a fairly easy job, you know, it's like mm-hmm. the guy you tell him to do this and he does it well, you tell him to do that and he does it well. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. I'm, I'm pretty lucky in that sense. Uh, I think he's, you know, he's a really good, well-rounded athlete. For well, sure. Tommy murdered me in juniors in the grade five. Oh, yeah? Destroyed me, yeah, quick, quick. <laughs> but I find it's interesting with tennis because you have the players like you described, like Tommy, who looks like a gifted athlete in in any sport you put Tommy to play any sport like you're describing he's probably very good at it yeah. but then you have other players like her catch maybe I was gonna say Blaze <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say Blaze <laughs> like Blaze is an example where he's around 300 now in the world I don't know if you know him Blaze big now he played Jamaica. with rival last week actually yeah, yeah I so play. no offense to Blaze if you watch this but like I'm <laughs> sure that if I put Blaze to play another sport he doesn't look like the most gifted athlete. But if you see Blaze play tennis and you see him serve, you see his hit the forehand with a crazy grip, or he has a short forehand, he's gonna step with the right foot, not <laughs> close stance. And it's like it's not the most typical, but he does those things very well. And so I find it interesting is you can have a little bit of both, you know, like you have the people who are naturally gifted that they can do everything with the right form, but then you have the other people who maybe are not the most naturally gifted athletes, but they have certain weapons and certain game styles and so much belief in their in their way of play that they're successful as well. You know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. I think that, you know, like the, I mean, what, what I meant with Tommy, you know, is that he has so many experiences when he was young. So it's something that actually, and he's gifted, but also, you know, you don't have to forget that he's an extremely hard worker player too. You know, he works hard and he's very detail oriented. Like when you ask him, you know, to get into certain details to correct and stuff like that. He does it really well. But then you have people, like you said, like like him, like Blaze, that probably in this specificity, they're extremely good. And you have a lot exactly. of tennis. In tennis, you have a lot of early specificity. And um, which is fine. You have a lot of players that they have made it through early specificity and stuff like that. And so that's why where the argument can start. But I feel like a player that has been exposed to different um, sports and model experiences, the base of the pyramid is bigger. You know what I mean? So the way you can build up is also taller. 
When you have a player that is really good in the specifics, I think that the base of the pyramid of the basic movements is probably not as, as strong. So I feel like it's tougher to build certain things and to improve certain things. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking always into a complete athlete. Yeah, then, then you got people that is, as you say, like naturally talented or stuff like that. But when we're talking about like the, the experiences that they have when they're young and stuff like that, that's what that gives you. The, it gives you a base on the pyramid that allows you to build probably higher up, yeah. you know, compared to a person that goes straight into the specific and, uh, and that's what he has done the, his whole life. Like we got a lot of that in tennis, you know, mm -hmm. kids that since they're five years old, they're like four hours on court and they're like doing like fitness drills that are like specific for them. And they make it, they, yeah. they, they can make it. Now I'm, I'm thinking like beyond that, I'm thinking also how efficient he is as a mover to not get hurt. Like, okay, like he's running from his change of direction. We were working before and stuff like that. So he doesn't get hurt and he has a longer career, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just. Uh, should we get in some Instagram questions? Do you have anything else? So we asked Instagram a few questions for you. So the first question was, Alex Stevens, what's your opinion on sliding on a hard court? And is it something you can teach? Or, yeah, do you teach that? Or what, what's your idea on it's that? A, it's a great question. We have a, oh, uh, we have a pretty good uh, talk with Tommy regarding that with Brad. Brad is uh, not a huge fan of sliding on hard court. Okay. Um, especially i want to be clear on this especially before the heating sometimes you know after the heating if there is some sliding after you know we're fine with it but we try to avoid it as much as possible does that mean that uh, does that mean that it's not going to happen no it's going to happen like you're going to see tommy sliding and heating many times i mean it's fine if it is a part of the game you know and, and it happens you know in a certain scenario and you need to use it you might use it, but it's not something that you want to be forcing. To the morning, it's funny enough, I was watching a, a practice of two juniors with uh, Raiwa and Ethan, and one of the kids, like, he had a ball, like, bouncing, like, two steps away from him, and he's, he went sliding, and I'm like, dude, I'm like, the new generation, he's like, <laughs> everywhere, like, you know, we want, we want, I, I mean, we grew up watching Mofis play, bro. Yeah, it's you got crazy, to slide. Right? If you're not sliding, you're not playing tennis. <laughs> <laughs> is that more for for injury reasons or for efficiency reasons? For efficiency reasons, for you know, like what we were talking before, for the idea of being well balanced, you know, for the position that you get into to recover after, for stress reasons, you know, in terms of, in terms of uh, injuries. Yeah, we try to avoid it as much as we can. As I say, if it happens. It happens yeah we're okay with it you know but if we can avoid it and we can do something different about it if we can run through the ball you know if we can like so we try to stimulate like the drill that you were shot like mm -hmm. talking about for example where tommy did you know that movement and then there is the video posted and stuff like mm -hmm. that he's not sliding you know he actually slides a little bit after the last forehand mm -hmm. he hits and then slides a little bit yeah. and that is some some of the process of what we been working, you know, and cleaning up his footwork during the last years, like when we started in 2019 to now with Brad, a lot has to do with that, you know, with the argument regarding slide or not slide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tough to say, you know, when you got someone like Sinner, you know, like sliding here. Everywhere. And, 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 but uh, in in our case, you know, with with Brad and what we have done with Tommy, we try to avoid it as much as we can. And if we can find a better way to move, if we can move faster on the ball and be able to to run through and create a better shot, you know, and stuff like that, we, we try to do it. I feel like also in terms of spacing, like for me at least, who I'm not a natural mover, like I feel like my hand-eye coordination is pretty good, but my movement is not necessarily the greatest. So if I'm, for example, on clay, you know, you're taught to slide before the ball because if you slide after the ball, you'll be out of position and like a mm -hmm. few steps, you know, more to recover. Yeah. But on a hard court, if I'm sliding into the court, I don't, I already have a challenge on clay, like, spacing like i don't know if i slide into a ball if i'll be too close too far and i feel like it's gonna be even worse on a hard court like you're not gonna know how close you are to the ball like if you don't slide naturally with different courts some are more gritty some are not gritty so like yeah. i mean i guess sliding after a shot at the end of the day now you're decelerating to try and change direction but if you're decelerating Correct. to stop at a certain moment that's why I, I find it challenging, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know, I know, 100%. I thought that the question was oriented to hard courts. That's why yeah, I, it was, of it course, was. on clay court, on clay court, we all me. know, you know. You, you <laughs> know no, no, on clay court, you know, we all know that you, you tend to, you know, like slide and hit, like get that little yeah. slide sometimes to kind of like load, use the use the court to, to load and then hit, to kind of like create force against the ground, grip the ground and 
but uh, but on the hardcore scenario yeah i think that definitely i i prefer and we prefer like to avoid as much as we can okay if it happens uh it's okay you know it's part of the game mm -hmm. but we try to avoid as much as we can the next question is from david uh what's the most common injury on tour and I'm guessing David has a little bit of tennis elbow. So he was asking what exercises can you recommend for tennis elbow? Yeah, I mean, the most common injuries on tour probably is going to be like, a, I don't know, on tour. There's many injuries that I've been surprised to hear about. Probably like, you know, like ankle leg like sprains and stuff like that tend to happen quite often. Okay. Um, because of the, the man's, you know, the sport of the shoulder. Uh, when you have so much internal rotation, like internal rotation in tennis with the serve and the forehand is pretty high, you know, the amount of, of times that you do uh, that motion. And, um, and as, as we were talking before, you know, like players, like they spend their whole life, like swinging the racket around and, and hitting a lot of serves. It's an extremely powerful, you know, the shot. And then also the forehand on the backhand, everyone tends to have, you know, the, the two handed nowadays even more. Um, so you don't have that much of external rotation or problem with external rotation, but in, there's a lot of internal rotation in a pretty like powerful way, you know, like yeah. the two biggest shots usually are the serve on forehand. So shoulder is a pretty delicate area. And uh, and many times what happen and going into the, the uh, you know, the tennis elbow thing is that sometimes the best solution is the, to check, you know, the technique. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, if there's something, I don't know if, you know, the person that has a question is a, kind of like a casual player or what, but a lot of those issues, they come from, from the from the form from mm -hmm. the technique on certain strokes so to pay attention to that because what we were talking before you know you do a lot of repetition of a forehand or a backhand or whatever it is where your form is not proper that's when that type of issue up, start appearing you know yeah. and uh, and i but it's tough to say like okay do this exercise or do that exercise because every injury can come for many different reasons you'll be like kind of like um, undermining you know like the physios work if i say yeah do this exercise for tennis i want you be fine or do that you find a lot of that on internet but there is 20 million reasons why an injury could happen <laughs> and the best thing to do is to work with the physio and to get okay like get checked and analyze and see okay why did this happen like, because yeah. probably like it could be like from instability on the shoulder joint, you know, that is not probably stabilizing one. And then when you're hitting the ball, you know, that thing is maybe the shoulder is fine, but that's probably, you know, like hurting the elbow mm -hmm. or the wrist, you know, ends up like hurting the, the weakest link, you know, on the chain and, and probably has nothing to do with his strength. Probably yeah. he's doing like, you know, like forearm exercises exactly. all day long, like straining the forearm. <laughs> but then, you know, the shoulder is not stabilizing and then, yeah, my elbow hurts, yeah. you know, so... It's very tough to be, yeah, do this and you'll be fine. Yeah. It sounds like so much of this is just eliminating things that could cause it. And you just eliminate mm -hmm. more and more of these things until... Be efficient, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, like everything that has to, you know, strengthen all, you know, the structure, yeah. it's going to help. But but I think that definitely like to have a, a good ev evaluation on why it's happening is very important to be yeah. able how to address it and where to target, you know. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Renata. What's the hardest part of your job? Working with her. I was gonna say this. Billy Red. Billy Red. That was an easy one. Huh? Uh, That's an alley oop layup. <laughs> I no. saw the answer coming as soon as she asked the question. I think she knew it too. She, so. Yeah, she knew I was gonna pull that one. But no, but if I have to to answer it like uh, for real, I think that is um, understanding. <laughs> or understanding. The, All right, next uh, question. No, I was gonna... <laughs> The demands of, uh, you know, of each one of my players, you know, like uh, really trying to pay attention to, because it, to believe that every player is, is the same and that you got to improve the, the same, you know, and work the same way with everyone, it's, it's undermining your athletes. So I think that you need to really pay attention, okay, what, what are the things that you have to get better? What are the things that you have to get better? What, and trying to address them in order to develop, you know, your player towards the tennis player that, that he wants to be or the coach wants him to be you know to me to work together with the coach is extremely important to get the the coach's feedback and tell me you know what are the areas that they want to because at the end of the day as we were talking before they're tennis player not fitness player so you need to listen to the coach you need to communicate with them and then based on that and what you see you know from your athlete try to put a plan together to to develop them and that's probably the toughest part of my job but also the better the more fun you know mm -hmm. like to try to work around the things that they need to improve i think it's a lot of fun yeah um last question and we already discussed it a little bit but 
Sebastian said that he feels like every time he plays a tournament, he loses like five to 10 pounds, similar to what you discussed. So he was asking what workouts and diets do you suggest to maintain the weight and muscle mass during these tournaments? And I guess we touched on it a little bit before, but if you can just go back to it one last time to, to let him know. Yeah, I think a lot of it usually tends to be liquid, you know, like a lot, a lot of it tends to be like, so paying attention a lot to the hydration. Uh, sometimes uh, people don't think about how much you're sweating when you're out there. So a lot of it for sure comes to that, but also like to <laughs> replenish the, the deposit of glycogen, like right after you finish uh, your matches and stuff is super important that you see like guys like Alcaraz, like posting and all or stuff like that, like where they're like trying to refuel right away. I think that having like he could try like tracking the daily tracking. I know some players, they try with like a more like, scale. So tracking, you know, your way before you go like in the mornings and, uh, you know, after the matches mm -hmm. and then according to how much you lose, you know, after the match. Okay. What is the recovery to put together a plan on? Okay. I have to eat and drink this, 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 and that supplement, you know, like having the right amount of protein on diet. Like, that comes from understanding your body as well, right? Like understanding how much you actually need. Like correct. it's not going to be something you can just do right away. You have to like learn your body, right? A hundred percent. It's the same that we were talking regarding my job, you know, how I try to learn from my own job. I think that people could like pay a lot more attention in that regard and be okay. You know, I play a match, I lose three pounds. What do I have to do for the next day to be back at my body weight? I'm going to, I'm going to try with this, this, this and that, you know, and then based on that, uh, you know, you start learning, how get into a learning curve that allows you to, to, you know, maintain your body weight through the tournaments, but also like, the same. I like I like giving credit, you know, and and working like with nutritionists or dietitians, stuff like that, you know. So if you get the opportunity to to do a checkup with them and try to get some professional help out of them, I'm not a specialist on the field, you know. I I always try to be very respectful of the other, you know, like specialists. I think that it's super important, and <coughs> and if they have the opportunity to work with someone like that, I mean that's key for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you unlock your phone for me? So, sorry, just to wrap up, we have a few housekeeping things, so yeah. not to keep you too long, but um, we've been doing this now since last April, and we've had a few people from the beginning of our journey till now have been like big followers of us, so I just wanted to say thank you to um, to Brian, Brian and his daughter, Addy, Ryan Allen, who's uh, De Bruyne, one of the Kevin De Bruyne, Bruyne KDB. Yeah, this went on a big uh, like subscription pre like uh mission last week to get us like 10 subs on youtube thanks to him <laughs> and a special shout out to will so i'll show you ryan Allen. i'll read uh will's comment for us for for the people who haven't seen it so this is on our last video from will he said the change of podcast is changing tennis this is the only place for real insight into the day-to-day -day grind of the pro tour spoken by the players we as tennis fans are so privileged to hear about the way they candidly speak on the mental aspect of the pro tour from nerves jet lag to many decisions that go into preparation and peak performance. As well, the dynamic between Jody, Justin, and Evan flows so well. You can tell how much they enjoy being with each other, except for Evan, and how well they, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, and how well they support the guests through thoughtful, provoking questions while keeping their laughter going throughout. I just bought the sweatshirt from the shop and I'm excited to rep it at Indie Wells next month. No misses so far with this pod and I'm ready to pop out. Thanks to Justin for this um, with y'all in 2024. So appreciate yeah, that. Big thanks to Will. That comment means a lot to us. We've been going, like I said, since last April pretty consistently and we're just trying to do the best we can. So thanks to everyone mentioned. Um, yeah, you can buy merch. We still have the Pro Stringer deal. Um, and yeah, just uh, I guess if you're watching the, this episode, still is the end of the episode. So the real ones are probably still watching. So obviously our goal is to get to a thousand subs like justin said at the beginning so anything that you can do to help us um to help i guess afford this business that goes a long way so yeah that's pretty much it for housekeeping um franco thank you for for joining us today great, and great us talk man appreciate it uh, thank yeah you guys. we enjoyed it thanks a lot thank you, guys. you guys are awesome thank what you guys you. are doing is cool i mean i, I agree with them I, the first thing that renata told me and the guys when i was coming they were like man those guys are super nice they're super cool people right? she said that she renata said that, that. <laughs> She said that. Nah, uh, no, 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 no. I swear, I swear, I'm right with you too. And someone, Ethan, Ethan had a great time. Ah. Yeah. So, no, no. So I was like, man, let's, let's do it. You know, I, I was pumped to come. And I think that what you guys are doing is, is awesome for, to show, you know, another side of the tennis part and like player's life. And uh, 
and of course I'm happy to be here. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Thank you. Me. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. Um, yeah, Ethan said that he he felt like he didn't have the best run at it. So hopefully, I mean, going forward, we can have Ethan on again and Kova and these guys. Like we enjoy it as well. So Ethan when, likes talking. That's yeah. <laughs> Don't They're always me. welcome. They're always welcome. And you are too. So whenever you want to come through and, and talk to us, obviously we'll have you anytime. So. It'll be cool. Probably we can do one together with the guys. Or yeah. yeah. All right, good, boys. Man. Thank you so All much. All right. Thank you.